Any uh, first-time visitors, first time you've ever come to New Covenant? No? Okay. Oh, welcome. We're glad you're here. You like getting put on the spot like that? (laughs) Um, There's nursery uh, back there this morning for the little ones, and then Kids Church will dismiss after our worship time here this morning. Um... Kind of a big thing happened. I don't know. I think it was just this last week. Coach Lynn got named as the KBA Coach of the Year. So, well deserved. Yep. Amen. Uh, Wednesday night, food pantry is open from 5.30 to 6.30. Um, life group and life kids are from 7 to 8 on Wednesday. So, Try to make it to that if you can. Today we're um, happy to have uh, Roger and Carolyn Tomlinson here um, and looking forward to what you have for us this morning. We appreciate you coming to Smith Center, Kansas. Um, Tonight at 6 o'clock there's a ministry team meeting and dinner, um, so if you're involved with that, please be there. Uh, If you've signed up to be baptized, Um, There is a sheet in the back where um, they're trying to figure out what day in September works best for everybody. So um, put your, oh, any week. Okay, everybody hear that? Every every Sunday, um, whatever works best for you, just get it on the the sheet back there. First come, first serve Sunday. The water will be warmer probably the second or third week than it will be the first, right? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Uh, I gotta get it together. Birthdays. We missed one from last week. Joy Kelly had a birthday on Friday, so happy birthday. Um, Mason Conway has one this week, so happy birthday, Mason. I don't know if they're here, didn't see them. Uh, anniversaries this week, Toby and uh, Jody Boyle, Gail and Jenny have one on the first, and Jerry and Lynette Voorhees have one on the second, so if you see them, tell them happy anniversary. <clears throat> Lord, we just thank you for um, our time together here this morning, and I just pray that you would be not only with Roger, with Carolyn, um, as he gives us a message from you, Lord. Um, Also be with Cassie and the little ones back there in Kids Church. Um, We sometimes forget what it's like to be a child and be able to um, just open up our hearts and hear what you would have us to say or have us to hear. Just thank you for Cassie and those others that are helping back there with that. Thank you for the rain that we receive, Lord. And just be with those in uh, the Louisiana area that's going to get hit with a storm today. We just pray you would be with them and keep keep things as safe as they can be with that moving in. And um, hopefully it will not be as bad as what they're thinking. We thank you for this place. We thank you for uh, Mike and Cassie and and everything that they do in this church, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. been 
and I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. journey and all the way to the end. I thank you for that. You are the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Hidden glory in creation. Now
your sin has no name because he doesn't see it anymore. It's covered by his blood and nothing can stand against it. Amen. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. One more time, what a powerful name. seated. Do you want to talk? No, nope, she just wants to eat it. I just wanted to uh, give one more plug um, to you young parents and those of you who um, have signed up for baby dedication. I think we have 13 babies signed up to be dedicated. Amen. I mean, no, that's a big deal. Amen. A community this size and where we are that's a big deal but not not because of the numbers it's a big deal because the commitment Roger I don't know what this microphone's going to smell like <laughs> just the commitments of the parents to say I'm dedicating this child to you God I know from whom it came and whom it will return amen and uh, I just I, I want to commend you parents with that and for doing that and making that statement and commitment. There's no better investment to make in life than people. People are eternal. And what, you know, Jesus said, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And we always refer that to children. And how many know we're all children of somebody's child somewhere? And it's just becoming more and more real to me recently of the effect, eternal effect that we have on somebody or God has on somebody through us because he chooses to work through people. Amen. God can move on somebody. He could knock you to the ground like the Apostle Paul. But he, he really most of the time works through people. And when you allow God to work through you and touch somebody's life, you affect generations. And that has just become so real to me recently when somebody speaks life to a, a young kid or anybody. It can change the, the trajectory of generations. Not just have them, not just make somebody have a good day. I mean, you know, that good day can turn into generations. Decisions that are made, turns that have been made, um, the effect on people's lives. And so I just encourage you, God works through people. And when you feel that, you are too pretty. When you, when you feel that nudge to encourage somebody, do something for somebody, say something, love somebody that somebody else isn't loving, that is your heavenly father trying to reach them. Amen. And it will affect generations. Roger. And Carolyn have been doing this for many, many years in all kinds of ways. And I, I think about this little girl is so loved and cared for, and she has it pretty good. She doesn't know it. But I think of all the ones that Roger and Carolyn care for and deal with. These are ones that have been orphaned or left or in tragic, tragic situations. And they, they pick them up. They didn't have to. They pick them up. They love them. They school them. They, they have a, a family that they belong to now. And it's just an honor and a privilege to have you guys here today and to share what you do 
in the lives of these people and the, the generations of effect. At, there's no way to tell. So we appreciate them. Would you welcome Roger and Carolyn Tomlinson this morning? He's going to come and share the word. Kids, we're not going to let you leave for Kids Church yet. There's a couple things that, that we'd like you to see that he's going to talk about, and then he'll dismiss you um, when he gets ready to preach. All right? All right. Thank you. Okay. Great to be here. I've got a, of course, missionaries always have a uh, slideshow, so I brought a slideshow to show you here real quick. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about the ministry. If you guys can go ahead and pull that up. Uh, there it is. Uh, I see it on the back. Okay. Uh, I want to uh, introduce my wife, Carolyn, back here. We're, I'm happy to have her with me. She doesn't get to travel with me all the time, and so we're, I'm excited that she's here this time. And um, We drove in. We have a home in Joplin, Missouri. Um, I'm not there that much. <laughs> She's there more than I am. I'm on the road most of the time doing this or down in Mexico. I got back from our children's home um, last week, uh, I guess on Tuesday. And so last Sunday, I was there with the kids. Um, so I want to run through these slides pretty quick. And uh, this, uh, uh, well, that's just the title there. So we'll go on to the next one. This is where we work. People always come up and say, where do you work in Mexico? Well, here it is. Uh, we work in all these different states. Our children's home is in the top of that dark blue state there. That's the state of Veracruz. That kind of runs down along the Gulf there. They had a little bit of a hurricane come in about the middle of that state last week. We got a lot of rain where we were at, but no damage or anything. But that's, uh, they get a lot, of, a lot of storms in that area and so on. Uh, down in that at the very bottom in that brown state, we have um, a ministry on an island. It's kind of an unusual thing. Uh, about 80 years ago, the country, uh, the country put in um, a reservoir there and basically dammed up two different rivers, and it formed this huge reservoir. It basically eliminated several towns down in the, down in the bottom. But there were also a lot of mountaintop villages, and those mountaintop villages became islands. And on these islands, that's an area down there where they're, uh, in that area, there are over 100 different dialects spoken. You think Mexico, Spanish? They have over 100 dialects, Indian dialects, in addition to Spanish, and each of those dialects have two or three sub-dialects. And so in that area, um, one of the mountaintop villages, which became an island, uh, is called Isla del Viejo Soyotepec. Um, there live about 1,500 Masotecan Indians. And they speak one of the Masotecan dialects there. And um, I heard about this island about 15 years ago, I guess. Uh, maybe a little longer than that, 17 maybe. And, um, of course, as an American, the first thing I ask about this lake is, are there fish in it and can you fish in it, you know? And they said, well, I don't know about that. I know that a lot of the people living on the islands make their living fishing out of it. And I go, oh, okay. And... So there's islands, and yes, and then um, kind of they said, well, uh, I asked, well, is there a church on that island? They said, no, no one goes over there. It's just a bunch of Indians live on that thing, and uh, outsiders just don't go. And I said, well, let's go. And we went, met a, um, a family, led a family to the Lord, uh, started doing home mi uh, ministry there, going around visiting the homes and so on. Pretty soon we had a Nice little congregation. We bought a piece of property down at the bottom of the island near the, near the water and um, started a church, built some cabins there, had a couple of our missionaries uh, staying there. I've got a friend of mine coming. He's driving in from Salina right now, and you'll meet Dennis later. I'll point him out when he walks in, so we'll embarrass him a little bit. But uh, him and his wife were the missionaries that basically founded that ministry on the island, and uh, they lived there for a number of years, and uh, he continues to go back. And forth as much as he can, and I do too. And and uh, we now have two churches on that island, and uh, good congregations in both of the churches. Uh, most of the people live up on the top of the island and on the mountaintop, and so you walk about a mile to get up there uphill. It is rainforest. It is very very tropical, uh, very hot, uh, very humid, uh, and so it's uh, a pretty good climb up there. So we'll go on to the next slide. Okay, this is our facility in Texas uh, where we do a lot of short-term groups. 
And if you're going to come down and visit us down there and do a group with us, you would probably start at this place here. It's a nice facility right on the border. We can house about 40 or 50 people there. Next slide uh, shows our facility in Dr. Arroyo, which is where we do most of our summer groups. It's up in the mountains, about 5,800 feet. Uh, it's high desert, so it's cool. Uh, at night, uh, warm during the day, but it's a dry heat, you know, so it's not real humid. It's, it's, uh, it may get up to 90 or more, but uh, it doesn't feel that bad if you're in the shade. But at night, it gets down cool enough that you'll need a blanket on your bed a lot of times. And so we do our summer groups there all summer. Beautiful place. This is a facility that we built, and you can get up on that flat roof. Um, there's a wall all the way around the roof, and you can get up on that flat roof and look around, and it's mountains Everywhere you look, 360 degrees, beautiful place. Uh, we do our lo a lot of our summer groups there. Next slide is, uh, oh, this is one of our churches. We have over 100 churches now in Mexico in our organization. And uh, this is one in the border in Reynosa. This church is kind of uh, really uh, a favorite of mine because uh, years ago I had a young pastor come to me and say, we have started a church on a rented piece of property. We have two by four walls built and we were going to start the roof and the landlord came and said that we have to move because he doesn't want a church on his property he said there's a property down the street for sale if you'll buy that we'll move the church down there and uh we'll be come into your organization and be pastors and build a church and i said well let's do that so we had a youth group on the border at that time we picked up the entire church the walls of the church and carried it about a block and a half down the street and put it on this piece of property that we bought. We'd poured a foundation there, and he built a beautiful little wooden church there. And I got to preaching to my pastors in that area one time on uh, faith and how you can't depend on the missionaries. You know, you, God's your source, not me, and you need to believe God. You know, if you want a bigger church, you need to believe God and go to work. And, and uh, I don't know how many of them really heard that, but he did. And I was going over to visit him. I was walking over. I walked from one church across the highway to the other church. And I heard his guy saying, hey, Pastor Sesa, um, here comes Brother Roger. He's caught you. And uh, uh, he had started building this and had the foundation up and the walls were going up and so on. And, and he built that thing almost entirely without any help from us. I think I, I gave him about $5,000 to help with the roof. But it's a beautiful facility there. Air conditioned, one of the few we have that are air conditioned. And uh, it's nice. Uh, next slide is, um, this is another church. Um, this is down in, um, near the Casa in uh, a town. And the church, actually, they built it up on top. They, it's just an empty lot right there, and we're getting ready to do a children's service. But uh, that's kind of how we start. We just clear off a lot and start building. And uh, this particular time, we were there, and we had unpacking our vans and doing a children's service. And uh, the pastor came and said, it's going to rain. If you don't want to spend the night here with us, you need to get your vans up on the pavement. And so we moved our vans and then walked back in and did a service. And it had rained by then, and everything was muddy, so we did a service right in the middle of the street. And uh, next slide. I'll go through this a little quicker. Here's some of our pastors at a pastor's conference uh, at one of our locations near Monterey where we have a school that we built. Uh, next slide. This is a, a church uh, uh, near where the children's home is, and it's children's service. Uh, we do a, a group that every Christmas. We've done it for 30-some years, and we take toys in and presents, do a Christmas service, tell kids what Christmas is really all about and share the plan of salvation their parents are there so the parents hear it too and then we pass out presents um everyone gets a little goodie bag a little um some candy popcorn uh everyone will get a toy of some kind and and then uh so most of these kids that's the only christmas they get is what we give them they just don't it's very poor area next slide okay we're here on the island dennis just walked in we're, there he is back over there hi dennis and I was sharing that you were the one that started the ministry there on the island, and him and his wife. So uh, you can visit with him later. He'll tell you a lot of stories. Most of them are good. Uh, this is a, a shot from the top of the island, uh, looking down uh, up on top after we've climbed up. Next slide. Uh, here's the boat going across. This is how we come in. 
Usually when we come in, that boat is totally loaded and sitting really low on the water. You'd be surprised how many people you can get in that and how, how much stuff. But uh, this is a small group. We're just going across for the day or something here, I guess, or we're getting ready to leave. Next slide. Okay, this is our facility d at, down below. Uh, the long building there is our church. Uh, the cabin right next to the building is Dennis's cabin where he lived. And then we have another cabin up on the hill and, a, and an outhouse, a bathroom. It's a nice outhouse. You know, it's got a fan in it and everything. But, uh, and uh, that, that's basically it. Uh, that on the end of the church is a kitchen, and, but we do our cooking outside of the kitchen. On a, it's a, like a wood table about this size, and it's a table, and they've filled it with sand. And they cook on that, build a little wood fire on that, have a couple rocks, and set some rebar on there to hold the pans and that's how they cook and uh we bring our drinking water in but we bathe down at the lake usually um uh, every night after dark uh next slide <laughs> uh this is the uh the sign this is the name of the church in uh Masotecan. it's basically in spanish it's the voice that cries out and uh i'll give you a uh, my best rendition of how to say that it's ningusi da si Miningi, and that means the voice that cries out. And I know one other phrase in uh, Masotecan. It is kundadi, uh, and that means kind of hello and how are you, and it's kind of an overall general greeting and so on. Other than that, I can't speak any. Dennis probably knows a few, few more phrases. It's a very difficult language to learn because it's a tonal language. There's like three different tones, and you can say the same word with three different tones, and it means three different things. So that's a little confusing. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of how we live when we're there. We sleep in hammocks. I think I'm eating a plate, plate of eggs there. And uh, this is in our church, inside the church. And we string our hammocks there during the day or at night. And then we pull them up during the day when we're having service and so on. But uh, it's pretty rustic. <coughs> Mosquitoes aren't usually too bad. Uh, next slide. Okay, we are. I got, <laughs> I got a guy, group of pastors they're all about my age, and we're heading up the mountain. And I thought I was going to lose a couple of them <laughs> on the way. <laughs> so uh, we're about, I think we're only about a third of the way there. And, uh, and these guys were supposedly in good shape, but it's a, it's a pretty good walk. Um, uh, next slide. So last, one of the last times, I think about a year ago when I was there, Dennis wasn't on that trip, but I was there, and they... Uh, they uh, went out and went hunting and got a special treat for us. If you don't recognize that, that is armadillo. <laughs> uh, never had armadillo before. I don't know if I'll ever have it again, but it was, it was, uh, it tasted like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> kind of strange chicken, but um, knowing what it was, they just cooked it on the half shell like that. You know, it's kind of armadillo on the half shell, but. Uh, it was, it was interesting. I ate quite a bit of it, and it wasn't bad. It really wasn't. It was kind of a white meat and a lot of bones and stuff, but uh, it, it seriously tasted a lot like chicken. They had, they had some spice and stuff on it, so um, you couldn't really tell what it tasted like. But uh, Next slide. Okay, so we're having a church, in a, and we bought a piece of property up on top for our uh, church up on top. Uh, we now have a building on that piece of property. We're almost finished. We're ready to put the roof on, but... Before we had the building, we met under this great big tree, and so we're doing a, a service here. And uh, I can't remember who preached at that, but toward the end of the message, one of the kids saw a snake up in the tree, and of course, church was over then, <laughs> and uh, one of the kids came up and knocked the snake down, and uh, I, I don't think he even hardly hit the ground before his head was cut off with a machete. One of our girls uh, that worked for us cut the head off, and, but uh, it, yeah, exciting times on the island. Uh, next slide. So this is a children's service. Um, this is kind of up on top. This, you can kind of see what the houses look like, thatch roofs, a lot of them. And this is kind of the soccer field. Uh, the houses are kind of all around this big field, and we play soccer there and so on. I don't. They, they do. Um, <laughs> my soccer days are over. Uh, but um, had a, probably close to 100 kids come out for this children's service. There's close to 1,500 people that live on the island, I believe. Right now, I'd appreciate you guys if you remember the island in prayer because they have an epidemic of COVID going on right now, and they aren't letting the boats cross over to the island anymore. Um, I got a note from 
one of our missionaries that's there on the island working, and he said they had three ladies die yesterday, and I heard they had like seven die last week. Is that right, Dennis? Yeah, six or seven days. So that's ten people in about a week's time. So, um, yeah, pretty serious stuff. And they have no medical. They have nowhere to go. They just get sick and either get better or die, one of the two. So appreciate you remembering them in prayer. Next slide. Okay, so this is our children's home. Uh, we started this about 12, 13 years ago, something like that. I can't remember. But um, this is, is the sign that was out in front of our old building. We started in a rented building, and um, we had the sign there, and it was a rented building. We lived there for several years, had a lot of, a lot of great times there, but the building was literally falling apart. Um, it was not built real well, and uh, the walls were moving, and there were cracks. We'd fill them, and the next day they'd be open again. And so we decided to build our own facility, bought the piece of property, and, and built that. We moved into it last year about this time, and we are already out of room. And so I didn't think we'd ever fill that thing up, but we are getting close. We have 30 kids right now. Um, next slide. Okay, this is David and Christina. They are the directors of the orphanage. They've been with us from the beginning. Uh, great folks. That's mom and dad, Mama Nina and Papa D David, and uh, to the kids. And uh, great parents uh, do a great job with the kids, have really been instrumental in changing these kids' lives. Next slide. Um, here's the facility, what it looks like before we build it. It's close to 5,000 square feet, and it's sitting on a hectare of land, or a hectare, which is... Uh, 2.47 acres, and uh, it was basically a sugarcane field. You can see to the side the sugarcane growing, and uh, we just bought it and cleared it, and uh, like they never got the cane out of there. It took forever to, we kept pulling it up, and it kept coming back. But this is before we painted it. You can see where we're trying different colors on, on the little splotches. Next slide uh, shows what it looks like now. Gorgeous building. Um, we're comfortable. Uh, God's just really blessed uh, to be able to help us uh, build that. Next slide. Okay, here's our boys. This was last Christmas, and I was looking at that last night with Carolyn, and there are four boys that we have now that are not in that picture, um, four little littler boys, all of them probably under 10, I think, the four that aren't in there. And then uh, good-looking bunch. And then the next slide is our girls, and there are five girls that aren't in that picture. And those have all come in the last couple months. And I think almost all of these have been with us since they were little. Um, the, the tallest girl in the front row is Maria. And she was like two and a half, three, something like that when she came. And so 18 months. Her little brother was 18 months. And... Um, Go back one slide if you can. Can you do that? Yeah. That's no way in the front, the light blue shirt uh, over on the end. And that's no way. And they're bigger than that now. So uh, great kids. I could tell you their stories and it'd break your heart. You would literally be in tears. Some of these kids, what they came from. And you couldn't tell it now. They are they're blessed little kids. Uh, next slide. Next one. <laughs> So we, have, we do uh, all their schooling there internally. Uh, the Mexican school system right now is a mess. They're doing their, their schooling online, and it's just lousy. And so we, we do it all at the, at the CASA. And uh, so you'll have kids that are 14, 15 that just came that can't read or write. In there with little kids, you know, uh, learning to read and write too. And, you know, we have um, some of our kids. Maria, the one that I showed you in that other picture, she was reading at three. Uh, she's just super smart. So is her, her little brother, Noe. And um, Maria used to read to some of the older girls, read the Bible to some of the older girls, the 12 and 13-year-olds and so on. But um, they are both just really gifted, uh, really smart. They have an older brother that's just really smart, really gifted. Uh, next slide. We're about done here. Here's some of the younger kids in another class. And we're, I'm not, I think we're teaching English there. So they're all learning English. Uh, next slide. That's it. Okay, I got a video. I'll show you the quick video, and then uh, we'll turn the kids loose, and we'll get into the Word.
All right. We can let the kids go now. Have fun, kids. So I want to share a few things. Um, well, before I get into the message, let me share this. Um, we do trips to the orphanage, and we would love to include some of you. I've talked to your pastors, and they are ready to go. They're going to get their passports, and we're going to get them down there first so they can kind of check out the, the water and the and accommodations, I guess, maybe, but um, just spend some time with the kids, and um, maybe when we come, when they get back, we can arrange a trip sometime when you guys can get a week off. We do one-week trips there. It will change your life, I guarantee you. Uh, some of you, the kids are going to own you when, you when you go down there. They are sweet kids, and uh, they, a lot of our groups cry when they have to go home, so I've had some threaten never to go home, but um, we, we'd love to have you come down and see us. We ha do trips over to the other facility there in Dr. Royo as well, that one up in the mountains, and we do, do that in the summer, uh, do the trips to the orphanage uh, in the cooler months because it is hot there in the summer. Uh, it was pretty miserable last week and with all the rain and the humidity and so on. But um, the other thing is, is we have a program for young adults as they get out of high school if they, before they go to college or if they want to take a, a month or a semester off of college, it's a missionary training program, a seven-month program. You'll spend seven months in Mexico. We spend about um, two months at our school facility where we do classroom training, get you ready to go to the mission field, uh, teach you how to do everything that you'll need to do in ministry and how to live on the mission field. We'll teach you how to take a shower with a bucket of water and uh, how to... Uh, wash your clothes on a rock and all those useful skills down there and then um, uh, we take you out and for about two months uh, we go down to the tropics and uh, minister down there you'll be around the casa you'll be down on the island for a little while and uh, get to see a lot of Mexico and then you come back and do a couple months there with our summer groups and help um, minister to them so Love to have uh, anyone interested in that. It's a life-changing experience. Uh, my son went uh, in the early years, and it's really made a difference in his life. And, you know, a lot of young people aren't quite ready to go to college when they get out of high school. It's great to take a little bit of time and see what God has for you to do and so on. Uh, after college, it's hard to do because you guys will go out and get student loans and everything else, and uh, you'll have to go get a job. So this is a great time to do it, and we'd love to have you... Um, consider that so i don't know if we have anyone here in that category but uh if we do or any, you know someone we'd love to talk to them so i'm going to talk to you a little bit about faith faith is one of the most misunderstood uh things in the bible and things in our christian lives and uh you know christians think that if god's not moving in my life it's because i don't have any faith and they think that if I had enough faith, I could get God to do about anything. And neither one of that's right. Um, first of all, nothing really is going to work in your life until you find out and figure out what God's wanting you to do. Uh, he has a purpose for everyone. We're not here by accident. And he has a purpose for every single person while they're on this earth. If you're a Christian, he's got something he wants you to do. And... Until you figure that out and start doing it, your life is going to be a little bit off cue, a little bit messed up, I think. You know, you, you can live a good life and never do what God wants you to do, and sure, and run out of time and go to heaven eventually and so on. And a lot of people live for what's here on the earth, and, but God has a purpose for you. And once you find that purpose, your life really starts to make sense. And so I would really... Um, what I'm going to say, the rest of this message, really is for those that are interested in doing what God wants them to do with their life. Um, faith is so misunderstood. You know, I came up, I've been in ministry for 50 years. I don't look that old, I know, but uh, I started when I was five. No, I didn't. <laughs> I was a messed up teenager on drugs and uh, just messed up, messed up life. I was raised down in Hayes. And uh, just, I was a bad kid. And God, for some reason, saved me. 
and put me in ministry, and uh, it's, it's, it's been a good ride, you know, all these years. And, uh, you know, God bless me early years and so on, but 30-some years ago, um, he called me to be a missionary, and then things started making sense. I started realizing that all those years before that, God was preparing me for what he had me to do. But kind of growing up in spirit-filled Pentecostal churches over the last few years, last 20 years or so, you know, there's been several movements about faith and so on, and, you know, the Word of Faith movement and, you know, some of these others and so on, and a lot of books written on faith and a lot of, you know, a lot of misinformation. And, you know, people believe, you know, there, there's a segment of Christianity that believes that if you have enough faith, you can get God to do anything. And that's not right. I've discovered after 50 years of walking with the Lord, he pretty well does what he wants, <laughs> whether we like it or not, you know, because he has the plan and he knows what he's doing with your life. And if, if you're fighting against what God's wanting to do with your life, you're going to be somewhat miserable. And things just don't work right until you get in the right place. And I can tell you now, let me just share this with you as a missionary that God's purpose for our life is to reach people for Christ. You may not be a preacher. You may not be a missionary. But has, your purpose has something to do with reaching people for Christ. Christ met with the whole church, the entire Christian community, about 500 people on the Mount of Olives and gave the final instructions to the church. He wasn't just talking to the 11 disciples. One was gone. He was talking to the entire Christian community, about 500 people, and he said, wait in Jerusalem until you get the Holy Spirit. And he says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That is our purpose. That was the command. That's the final instructions before he left. He said that until the uttermost parts of the earth and then went to heaven. And he's waiting until we do our part and get our part done until he comes back. He said, why doesn't he come back? You're not done. There's still people to reach. There's, the harvest is overripe. And we're living in some days right now where people need the Lord. And I know you, you're thinking, well, what could I do? There's a lot you can do. When I, was, when I got saved, I, w I got saved through an Assembly God evangelistic team. And, of course, they immediately get me in the local Assembly God church in Hayes. And I walk into the Assembly God church in Hayes and had long hair, and I, I looked look a mess, you know, and I think people are saying, oh, man, that guy needs the Lord, but I was already saved, and I got up and testified that day, and a little old lady came to me, and she said, it's you. I said, yeah, and she said, no, I've been praying for you. I go, I don't even know who you are, and she said, well, I used to look out my kitchen window, and I'd see you sitting out on the back porch of the neighbor's house. And it was my girlfriend's house. And she said, you look so miserable. And the Lord told me to pray for you that you got saved. And I said, well, he answered your prayers. You know, everything I've done from that point on for the kingdom of God, she has a part in. She shares in that. That's part of her reward because she was faithful to do what God called her to do. Just a little old lady that knew how to pray. Everyone can do that. And so God has something he wants you to do. So what I'm going to say now is I'm going to give you a few tools that will maybe help you along the way. Let, let's turn to Mark in the sixth chapter, and I'm going to start reading with the 30th verse. And it says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, and many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them 
because they were like sheep <coughs> without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Would you bring my water? <coughs> so let me kind of set the stage and show you, tell you what's going on here. So Jesus had <coughs> sent his 12 disciples out to minister in pairs of two. And they'd gone out to a bunch of villages and ministered. And Jesus, while they were doing that, he was doing his thing with large crowds of people. <coughs> Excuse me. During this time, Jesus has just been informed that his cousin, John the Baptist, was killed by Herod. And about the same time, <clears throat> these 12 disciples come back, and they are pumped up. They are excited because of all that God had done. They come back, you know, in a different um, one of the Gospels, it says, and they said, even the de demons are subject to your name. They were, they were men of God now. I mean, they were doing stuff Jesus was doing. They were healing. They were casting out devils. God was working miracles. I mean, these guys were walking tall when they came back. And Jesus, I think, looked at them and thought, wow, you know, we probably need to bring these guys back down to earth for a little bit. I haven't eaten for a while. I need to get up and spend some time with my father and pray. I'm grieving over my cousin. Let's shut this meeting down, and we'll go to a quiet place and spend some time. Great. The 12 looked at him and said, yeah, we're all for that. Vacation with Jesus, you know. We're going to take a little cruise, end up in a, another land, and uh, spend some time with Jesus. Just us. We don't have to put up with all these crowds. So they get in a boat, and they head out. Well, the people figured out where they were going, ran around on the shore, and met them there when they got off the boat. And so the crowd that Jesus had just dismissed, it was there waiting for him when he came back. <clears throat> So they land, and I think the disciples were probably a little bit put out by this, maybe. So Jesus begins ministering to them. He says he, he realized they were sheep without a shepherd, lost. So he just, in compassion, just starts ministering again. Even though he's tired, even though he needs to pray, even though he needs to talk to the boys, and he starts praying. And so the disciples, I think, came up with this plan. He says, you know, if we get these people out of here, we can have some time with Jesus. So they went to Jesus and said, Jesus, we're very concerned about the people. They haven't eaten, and they're going to die because they're in this foreign place, and they have no food. You need to dismiss the service and send them home. Of course, Jesus, he says, well, feed them. So they, they say, well, they look at him and say, well, Jesus, it would take eight months of a man's wages to feed this many people. It said there were like 5,000 men. Well, that means there were probably close to ten to 12,000 people there, counting the women and children. And so they say, it's eight months of a man's wage to feed 12,000 people. And then they make this statement, do you want us to spend that much money on these people? They didn't say we don't have the money. They had the money in the bag. But do you want us to spend that much money on these people? And Jesus said, well, what do we have? Well, <laughs> we got five fish and, or five loaves of bread and two fish. You know, I think they told him that just kind of illustrating the fact that they weren't going to be able to feed the people. And Jesus says, okay, that'll work. He's getting ready to do something. He has just rang the bell, and school is in session now. He's, he's preparing to teach his disciples one of the most important lessons they'll ever learn. How to believe God. How to have faith. And so he says, well, have them sit down in groups. He takes the five loaves of bread and the two fish. He prays over them and breaks them. 
gives them to the disciples and say, okay, feed the people. And they're probably about through about 5,000 people where they begin to realize, what? This is a miracle. We still have bread left, and we're almost done feeding these people. You know, and they, they go and they feed all these, all these people. And then Jesus says, okay, pick up what's left. Why in the world did he do that? He says, pick up the fragments. And it says, they gather up all the pieces of bread and fish that are left, and it filled 12 baskets. 12. Not 13, 12. And the word that they use in the, in the Greek for basket is kolphinus, which it's, means a large basket. So they had these 12 large baskets full of fish and bread. Now, that's more than five loaves and two fish, right? Jesus has just broken a fundamental law of nature. You don't feed 12,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. He's just broken the law of nature. And then to top that off, he's gathered up the remains, and there's more now than there was before. And it's in 12 baskets. So here comes the good part. Okay, boys, school's out. Let's see what you learned. And that's how God does with us. You know, he teaches us something and then sees if we can put it to practice. And that's what our life is all about, is learning how to walk in the will of God. And so he dismisses a group of people and he tells the disciples, get back in the boat and go to the other side. I will meet you there in the morning. Let's find this here. I'll read this. Okay. Uh, well, I guess I don't have that. But he, he tells me, he says, go to the other side. I'll meet you there in the morning. So they get in the boat. And Jesus is heading up to the mountaintop to pray, spend the evening with his father. Here's my question. What happened to the 12 baskets of bread and fish? Think about it. <clears throat> Did Jesus, Jesus haul 12 baskets of bread and fish up to the top of the mountain so he could pray to the father? I don't think so. Did he tell the people to come up and pick up a basket on your way home? He wouldn't have picked them up if he went to, meant the people to have the, the fragments. So here's what I think. I think the 12 baskets of bread and fish went in the boat with the disciples. That's for tomorrow or whatever. And so they head out. But... What the disciples don't realize at the time is that Jesus has sent them out on the Sea of Galilee in a small boat filled with 12 men, 12 baskets of bread and fish into a storm. And the storms on the Sea of Galilee were pretty violent. He's got at least four professional fishermen that have raised, has spent their entire life working on that sea. And they are out there in the middle of this storm that Jesus sent them into. Did he know it was going to happen? I believe he did. I believe that was the test. He sent them into a storm, and Jesus is up on the mountaintop watching them in the spirit. It says, when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples... Straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Listen to this. <clears throat> About the fourth watch, early, early morning, after they've fought the waves and the wind, their boat is now almost ready to sink. The bread and fish are saturated with water. They're in trouble. And he's watched them all this time praying for them, 
And it says, about the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. What? Jesus is going to the other side where he was going to meet the disciples. He said, I'll meet you on the other side in the morning. Sorry. (laughs) But... These guys are scared. They're in trouble. They think they're going to die. And so they cry out to Jesus. They say, Jesus, we're dying out here. Thank God it's you. Help us. Fear and unbelief had caused them to forget what had happened just a couple hours before. And that's what happens to us. When we're faced with a need, we forget. We get fearful. On the mission field, we see, we see things happen. We see God answer sometimes supernaturally. I could tell you stories. Well, I was uh, in the old days in Mexico back when I first started. You had to basically either pay big sums of money or smuggle anything you wanted to get in. And I kind of leaned toward the smuggling part. (laughs) We would hide stuff in our van we didn't want them to find. And I was coming in for Christmas, and I had just a day or so to get all of our candy and some of our presents into Mexico. I was driving a van, and I was nervous because I was so loaded. I mean, I had boxes of candy stuck under all the seats, and I had kind of sheets laying on the seats so you couldn't see the boxes. I'm thinking, if any of them get in this van and open the door, they're going to see the candy. I'm going to be in trouble. They'll take the candy. They'll take, probably take the van. I may end up in jail. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, and I was praying. You know, that's when you pray your best prayers anyway, you know, when, you, when the stress is on. We were out in the middle of the sea, and a boat was sinking because of all the, all the bread and fish, and, and uh I am praying. I'm thinking, Lord, you're going to have to help me if I don't get this candy in. There won't be any candy for the kids. These kids need something, you know. We need to do Christmas services. I'm giving the Lord all these excuses. And I'm not praying in faith. I'm praying in desperation. You know, there's a difference. There is no faith involved here. You know, I'm thinking, God, gee, just somehow work a miracle. I've screwed up. I should have made two trips. Just bless me in my ignorance, my stupidity, Lord, and And I come up to the second checkpoint. I got through the first one somehow, and I'm just rejoicing. I'm thinking, oh, the dreaded second checkpoint. That's where they really checked you. And I'm coming up to the second checkpoint, and I'm praying and praying, and there's two cars in front of me, and then one car in front of me, and then it's my turn. And right as I'm getting ready to pull up to the checkpoint, my van dies. And I said, dear God, I'm going to jail (laughs) in Mexico. I was devastated. I said, Lord, I have prayed. Lord, why would this happen? And you know, the guard, he's up there going, and I'm, dun, 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 you know, trying to get the thing started. It would not start. And after about three or four minutes of that, the guard just shook his head like this, and you, he, you could tell he's mad. And I thought, great, a mad guard's going to come inspect my van. And he comes back and he flags a couple of the other guys over, and they push my van through the checkpoint and get me over to the side of the road, and then they go back to inspecting cars, and I'm going, what just happened? I turn the key, and the van starts immediately, and I drive off. I'm thinking... Dear Lord, I guess you can't answer prayer. <laughs> you know, there were so many times on the, when we were starting the, the children's home, we were starting to build, well, when we were working on the old building, I had a lumber yard give us a whole stock trailer full of lumber and sheetrock and plumbing supplies. I mean, there was n- nearly enough lumber to build a house with there. And... You know, I, this friend of mine that got this donation from this lumberyard down in Arkansas, I said, yeah, I got this donation. You're going to love this. And I, he told me what he had and all this lumber, and I thought, 
you can't import lumber into Mexico. They won't let you bring it in. You can bring in $50 worth of lumber a day. And he says, yeah, we're going to bring it down the board and let you get it across. <laughs> I was like, great. And I'm thinking, I can't get that across. It's against the law. I mean, you can't smuggle in a stock trailer full of lumber. And uh, so I called someone, and we had the social services department we were working with in the town we were working in um, write a letter asking the aduana, the customs agents, to give us favor. And so we get up there, and a girl comes out to inspect, and she says, no, you can't bring that in. I said, well, I got a letter from Deef from the social services. She says, that doesn't make any difference. We don't work for Deef. And I said, well, they said that you would help me get this in. No, you can't bring it in. And the girl was nice. She was wanting to help us. She says, I'll tell you what, let's go talk to this um, customs broker over here. And those custom broker is the guys that professional importers. They, they make arrangements, do all the paperwork to import things like that. And, uh, you know, they bring in the big equipment and uh, everything that goes in Mexico goes through a custom broker unless it's under a couple thousand dollars in value. And so they go talk to a couple of these custom brokers standing there and, and they say, can you help this guy get this material in? It's going for an orphanage. The guy looked at and says, no, I can't get that in. He says, there is no way I could get that in. You have to have an agricultural permit from Mexico to bring lumber in. He says, it's impossible. And so we sat there and we were there several hours. And this girl, I mean, she says, I'm sorry, I'd lose my job. And I said, I understand, you know. And I'm thinking I'm going to have to make about 2,000 trips with two pieces of lumber each trip, you know, and, and, uh, or just not bring it in. And we needed it. And so we're all praying, of course, and another prayer of desperation. You know, what are we going to do, Lord? Somehow you've got to help us. And the shift changes, and we're sitting there kind of blocking traffic, you know, and Pretty soon, the big boss comes out, and he just came on shift. It's about 12 o'clock at night. And he says, what is going on out here? And he says, they said, well, he's trying to bring this load of lumber in, and we told him he can't bring it in. And he says, oh, he can't bring that in. Uh, well, yeah, we know. And he said, what's it for? And I said, well, it's for an orphanage uh, that we're building. You know, DEEF is helping us, and social services, DEEF. And he said, well... I'd let you bring it in if you had a letter from Deef. <laughs> he says, well, well, that makes all the difference in the world. That letter meant nothing before till God moved. And, I mean, miracle after miracle, you know, I could tell you stories all day about what God does and how he supernaturally moves. He does that up here, too. Sometimes we don't recognize it, but, okay, we've got to get back to these guys. They're in the boat. <laughs> They're desperate. They cried, Jesus, help us, help us. It says, Mark 6, 51, Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. Here it is, a big verse. Ready? For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Have you ever seen that in there before? First time I read that, I go, what? They had forgotten about what Christ had already done. Well, that's a great story, Brother Roger, but how does that work for us? How, do we, how, do we, how does that help our faith grow? Faith, you've got to understand, is something that, you know, you say, well, I don't have any faith. Yeah, you do. You wouldn't be a Christian if you weren't faith. We're all given a measure of faith so that we can receive Christ. And after that, your faith begins to grow. It's not something you, well, today I have a little faith and tomorrow I have great faith and I'm healing the sick and opening the eyes of the blind. You know, and you see these guys that it's easy to preach about faith. Well, if you had faith, God would heal you, you know, and it's easy to preach that. And a lot of these guys preaching it have walked in faith and walked in a faith ministry and, and used faith and seen God move so many times that faith has grown up into their life until it's a big tree. Jesus said, faith is like a seed of mustard that's planted in the ground, in this ground right here. 
And it begins to grow as you feed it and provide for it what it needs to grow, and that's living in accordance with God's will and plan for your life. And as you feed it and water it, and it grows into a giant tree. Mustard seeds weren't supposed to grow into giant trees, but they do, like if you're comparing it to faith. Faith grows in the right environment in your life. You just don't have it or, or have it. It's not that simple. It's just that... Has it grown up? Have you provided what it needs? So how does this work? What's all this, what's all this saying here? Let me tell you how this works. If God has ever answered one of your prayers, think back. Has he ever answered a prayer for you? You're sure of? Well, he saved you. If he's ever answered one of your prayers, you can use that to cause your faith to grow. Let me give you a real good example out of the Old Testament. Young boy by the name of David is visiting his brothers on the battlefield, and they're making fun of him. He said, what are you doing here? You just came out to see people die. You know, you just came out to see the battle. They're making fun of him. He's, he's, why aren't you at home taking care of those sheep? And David hears this giant come out and challenge the entire army of Israel. He says, send out your best warrior. And if he kills me, we'll serve you. If, you kill, if I kill him, you serve us. And he's been doing this for days now. <clears throat> and Goliath was actually calling out Saul because Saul, it said, stood head and shoulders over every man in Israel. He was the tallest guy there, the biggest guy there. Goliath's calling Saul, the king, out. And David hears this, and the guys are talking about it, and they're saying, yeah, if anyone goes out there and kills him, they get a, a Saul's daughter for a wife. And, and David goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. If I go out and kill that giant, I get Saul's daughter for a wife? The king of Israel becomes my father-in-law? And his brothers look at him and say, go home. You're embarrassing us. He says, no, 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 wait a minute. He goes over and talks to someone else. He says, is that right? I, I, I get Saul's daughter as my wife? If I, all I have to do is kill that giant? And they say, yes, what? Yeah. You're going to go kill the giant? Well, you, I could. Yeah, right. You aren't even shaving yet, dude, you know. <laughs> He's just a kid. So... Saul hears about this and says, hey, Saul, we got a guy that says he'll go kill the giant for you. He's like 13 years old. Saul says, well, bring him to me. <laughs> you know, if they kill this 13-year-old, it won't be any problem. You know, they'll just say, well, he's just some kid that got excited and went out, you know. And, but Saul says, so you're going to go kill the giant? He says, yeah, I can do that. He says, Saul... <laughs> David, you weren't even, you aren't even a warrior. You'd never even seen battle before. And David goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I remember the time when I was watching my father's sheep and a lion came in and took one of the lambs and I went out and killed that lion with my bare hands. And I remember the time when a bear came in and took one of the lambs and I went out and fought that bear and killed him. It says, this giant will be just like that lion and just like that bear because he has offended the name of the living God. What did he just do? He used things that had already happened in order to increase his own faith that he was able to believe God for something impossible. I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear should be able to kill a, lot, a giant. The disciples looked at those wet, soggy baskets of bread and fish and thought, should we throw this overboard? We're going to die if we don't. And never realized that that was evidence of God's power, evidence that God was bigger than the elements, bigger than nature, bigger than anything, and that he could do anything you ask if you were just able to believe walking in the center of his will.
You remember the story of Joshua when he crossed the Jordan River? You know, he's walked with these people for 40 years. I mean, they're burned out, they're tired, and they're going to go conquer the promised land now. And, and uh, I'm sure they weren't real fired up about going to battle against the city of Jericho. The city of Jericho had walls that were, you know, several, you know, I think 21 feet thick, the first wall, and then the second wall was about eight feet thick, really high. The door shut. There's no way they're going to beat that city. There's no way they can go and get in there. And so Joshua has to lead his men into battle against that city. And they are ready to cross the Jordan River. And Joshua says, I want the priests to take the Ark of the Covenant. And they're going to step in the river first. Well, the river's at flood stage. I mean, it is, it is moving down, you know, and, uh, and, and it's high and it's, it's flooding. And so the priests... They're supposed to step in the river first with the Ark of the Covenant and walk out into the center of the river and stand there. And, sorry. <laughs> and then all the people are going to cross. And so the priests step out into the water, and as soon as they touch the water, the water stops flowing and starts to heap up. And pretty soon, the riverbed is dry ground, just like the Red Sea. And the children of Israel cross across on dry ground while the priests are standing there in the middle of the river, holding the Ark of the Covenant. Powerful miracle. He just broke the laws of nature himself. And then Joshua says, okay, I want one man from each tribe to go out and pick up the biggest stone you can carry and bring it in here and we're going to pile it up right where we're, our camp is. It says where they were lodging. So they bring these 12 large stones. They probably had the biggest dude in the, in the, in the tribe pick up this rock and carry it in, you know, took everything he had and they pile it up right in their camp. And Joshua says, this is so you will remember what God has done. And so the next day, well, a couple, three days later, I think they had some other business to do then, but a couple days later, they head to Jericho. And they march around the city wall one time and then go back to camp. And when they go back to camp, what do they see there? They see this pile of stones. And the Bible says, it's so you will remember that the hand of God is powerful. So every day they come back thinking, there's no way we can beat this city. Oh, wait, the hand of God is powerful. Oh, yeah. The next day, same thing. Two days, hand of God is powerful. They see this big monument of what God has done. They realize that God can do anything. And that he's with them, that he's telling them to go to take the city. On the seventh day, they are pumped up and ready to go because they are believing God because of the evidence of what he's already done in their lives. So how do you use that? How does that work? You pray. First of all, you make sure you're where you're supposed to be with God. Things work better. You pray, Lord, I remember the time when I was sick and I needed you to heal me and you healed me. I remember the time when you answered that miracle on my job that I was praying about. I remember the time when you blessed me. I remember the time when this happened or that happened or where you kept your word in my life. I remember the time and just like that time, you're going to answer this prayer. I am believing you because I know what you have already done in my life. And I know that you will do it again. I, have, I was not a man of faith when I went to the mission field. I didn't, I didn't know how to believe God. I preached on faith many years, but I didn't know how to believe God. I didn't know how to have faith. 
I was taking my family. We were going to live on faith, and I closed my business down and trust God, and I didn't know how to believe that. I didn't have any contacts. I didn't have any supporters, but we prayed. Somehow God did it. We've been there 33 years, and we are just as blessed now as we were more so financially as we were when I was working as a plumbing contractor, making good money. And God has done so much there. We have over 100 churches. We have, you know, facilities in three different places. We have, well, four, really, counting the one on the border. We have an orphanage. We have seen the lives of kids touched, all because God taught me how to pray and to believe him. I'm going to close. This isn't one of those messages you really shout with. I understand that. But I think you'll find it to be one of the most powerful tools that you have to believe God. Let me give you one more verse that just kind of caps it all off. It's found, I think, in the 12th chapter of Revelations. It's talking about a group of people that had believed God and were now with the Lord. And it says, talking about how they overcame the enemy, the devil. And it says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Triumphed over, I'm reading it. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The blood of the Lamb is past tense. It happened over 2,000 years ago. We have the blood of the Lamb right now, and we have our testimony. Our testimony is what God has already done in our life. And we can use those two things to fight any tool, any enemy, any devil, any problem we have in our life. We can use those two tools, the blood of the Lamb. I am called. I am filled. I am covered by the blood of the Lamb. And I know what God can do because I have seen him do it. You can walk through hell at a slow pace and not get burnt. Because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of your testimony. I remember the time, Lord, when I killed that lion. I remember the time when I killed that bear. I remember that pile of rocks. The hand of God is powerful. And God can use those things to help you to pray more effectively. But in closing, I want to make sure of one thing. That you're where you're supposed to be with the Lord. Because nothing works right until we are. I would encourage you to spend some time with the Lord today. Say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Why am I here? People think we're just living through life, you know, just uh, until we get done, until we get sick or die or until we run out of time and we get old and die or whatever. You know, we think we're just here and, you know, God's given us blessings and let us have a family and good life and kids and grandkids and all that's wonderful. But you're here for a reason. You need to find out what that reason is. Life's a whole lot smoother when you're, when you're fulfilling what God's called you to do. Spend some time with the Lord. I mean, you don't have to go to the mission field unless God's called you to go there. You don't have to stand in the pulpit and preach. You can just pray for your neighbor. Whatever he's called you to do, he'll use you we're here until he's done with us. Once he's done with us, he'll take us home because things are a lot better there. We think this life is precious, and it truly is. But it's better over there. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your blood that Jesus shed on the cross that gives us power and authority over the enemy that we have to face. Thank you for all that you've done in our lives, Lord, for the testimony you've given us. 
Help us to use those two things, Lord, to conquer anything the enemy throws in our path. And Lord, we just thank you for using us. Thank you for having control of our lives. We submit our lives to you to do whatever you want to do in our life, Lord. We just thank you for that now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, we have honey and coffee back there for sale. It benefits the, it helps support the children's home. So if you're interested in that, we'd love to talk to you about it. All right. Let's hear it for the word today. Amen. Wasn't that good? I always wondered why that it frustrated me so much when people would say, well, all there is left to do is pray, or all I can do is just pray. How many ever heard somebody say that or say that yourself? Come on, be honest. All I can do is just pray. I can't really do anything for God. Right there is what happens when you pray. 33 years of mission ministry of a kid sitting on somebody else's back porch and you just have that nudge. I really need to pray for that boy. Everybody say that with me. 33 years. A hundred churches. Thousands, countless people. Because of one old lady praying for a kid. She never even knew his name on the back porch. Don't tell me you can't do anything. Come on, stand with me. There's something we can all do. What a word, Roger. Thank you for tying so many things together. I've never saw that part about that they forgot the loaves. I'll preach that. Thank you. <laughs> I preach it somewhere else now, but oh, that's good stuff. Good, good stuff. How many are encouraged today? Amen. Make a list of the things he's done and pin it on your fridge when you, every time you leave and you come back home. I, I want to do that one too. I want to stack up some rocks and do an illustration every time they come back from going around the wall. We just walked around the wall, nothing happened. Oh yeah, there's those rocks. We just walked around the wall, nothing happened. Oh yeah, there's those rocks. Finally, after about six times, they're like, let's go! Good word, good word, good word. Good word, good word, good word. Father, I praise you. I praise you for the truth of your word. I praise you for the things, the countless blessings that we forget, we take for granted that are right in our boat in the midst of our storms. Strengthen and encourage us. I thank you because you have and I as we go forward into whatever you've called each one of us into to do. Whether we're going through a, a struggling of our own, whatever way that may be, relationally, financially, whatever we're doing for our jobs, our health. Father, thank you for reminding us today to just remember the right hand of Almighty God. Thank you for it today. I thank you for Roger and Carolyn and all that they do, all the ministries that they help support, lead, and direct. Father, what would you have us to do? I'm asking to touch each one here today to help them in whatever way that you've called us to help them. Speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name us to go out and live the life you've called us to. We give you praise. If you agree with me, say amen. Amen. I want to thank all of you for watching online today. If you want to support this ministry, I thank you that you will support this ministry. You're welcome to give it here at the church. Um, everything that comes in today completely is going to go to this ministry um, and what they're doing. So you're, you're welcome to give it that way. I'm sure there's other ways you give directly to them back there. You can support by buying the coffee, the honey, things with them you can get with them to con for contact information um, to directly uh, support them as well so thank you guys for coming thanks for all that you do all that you give hope you have a great week don't forget to count the rocks remember the rocks amen
God bless you and thank you.